Welcome back to On the Trail to Skull Hill. Today, we close our journey. We've gone to the cross of Christ, but the story does not end there. And the season of Lent takes us up to the holiday we call Easter, to Resurrection Sunday. Before we really consider the implications of the resurrection, because it's kind of a big deal, <laughs> it's a really big deal, let us just kind of try to summarize this trajectory towards centering the cross in our discipleship, in our theology, in our view of who God is and how we are to respond to him. I want to read a section here from The Cross of Christ by John Stott. And I want to kind of tie this idea up, this season that began in ashes, that involves fasting, that's this journey to the cross of Christ. It's one that can help us understand our discipleship. What is the trajectory of this? Why the cross? And ultimately, Jesus invites us to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves. So let's read this and chew on it together. To deny ourselves is to behave toward ourselves, as Peter did toward Jesus when he denied him three times. He disowned him, repudiated him, turned his back on him. Self-denial is not denying ourselves luxuries such as chocolates, cakes, though it may include this. This is actually denying or disowning ourselves, renouncing our supposed right to get our own way. Paul must have been referring to the same thing when he wrote that those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. No picture could be more graphic than that. An actual taking of hammer and nails to fasten our slippery, fallen nature to the cross and thus do it to death? The traditional word for this is mortification. It is the sustained determination by the power of the Holy Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body so that through this we may live in fellowship with God. And so once again here, we are attempting to understand this, this idea of beginning with our humanity, that we're human, that we have this sinful nature, that, that there is something in us that is compromised, that tends to put ourselves first. And what this journey to the cross, this self-denial, this strong word here, mortification, it's not about learning to dislike or, or, or to neglect or even to hate ourselves. I hope you're not hearing that in this invitation to discipleship. That's not what the theology of the cross is talking about. That's not even what this concept mortification is talking about. But it's an idea that through denying ourselves, we're actually becoming more of who we are. As we follow Jesus, we find our hearts turned, not in, and with selfish concerns and selfish ambitions and the preservation of self, but with others. It comes back to loving God and loving people. This is the transformation that we want to see when we pick up our cross and deny ourselves. It's not to become people of low self-esteem or people of low self-worth, but people who understand that the great dignity we have is shown by God's sacrifice of Christ on the cross, that we are deemed by him worthy of his love. Why else would he sacrifice his son for us? But in doing so, when we follow, when we mimic Christ, when this thing called discipleship, as we journey to the cross, we find our hearts transformed. We can call that mortification that the sinful desires, the desires that are self-centered, I'm not talking about being able to enjoy things or being able to enjoy yourself or being able to enjoy others, but when that desire is compromised, that is what is dying on the cross, that we become other-centric, that we become God-centric as we see in Christ. I hope that's helpful as we see this participation in the cross and the participation in the death of Jesus as we, you know, we called it in this series, uh, the journey to Skull Hill, that, that we uh, were framing this the way that the disciples, the way that the early church framed it, that we join Jesus in his death in some way. That's what the, the journey of discipleship is. So I hope we've understood the proper nuances of that, that this transformation is indeed 
life-giving. We will find ourselves satisfied in God. Even if it looks on the outside like denial or fasting or uh, becoming a servant, all of these things where we participate with the character of God and we, we do the things of Jesus, I hope we see that that, that is actually life-giving. But to this point, that if we participate in Christ's death, we participate in Christ's resurrection as well. And here's where I want to hinge our focus as the season of Lent wraps up and we look at Easter Sunday, the the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb becomes our focus. For death was not the end of this story. Mortification of the fleshly desire is, is, is not the final word. It is part of the process. But the final word is an embodied resurrection that Jesus came back in the flesh. So there's this interesting way that Paul describes this. He talks about Jesus as a first fruit. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Wait a minute. He's the first of a great harvest. This word, it's it's the concept of a first fruit. If you have a fruit tree in your yard, let's just say somehow you got lemons to grow in Southern Appalachia and you have a lemon tree and ooh, you're so excited because your first lemon is right there. There it is. It's so beautiful. It's so yellow and you reach and you pick it and it's great. It's amazing. It's the first fruit. You know more are coming and you come back the next day and there's a banana and you're not crazy about bananas. You're like, what the heck? It's yellow. It's it's on a tree, but this is not this is not a lemon. It's not, I mean, what what are we doing here? What's going on? Yeah, that's not how fruit works. <laughs> if it's a lemon tree, you're gonna get lemons out of the lemon tree, not bananas. Okay, I think I've made the point clear. The idea is Jesus as first fruit. What what he's raised from the dead. He came back as a a bodily figure. If you look through the gospel accounts, he's eating with people. He's allowing people to touch him. He's not like some sort of ghost or some sort of disembodied thing. He doesn't have like wings. He's not running around with a harp on a cloud. It's is Jesus, the man in the flesh. And do you realize this, this, this idea of going to the cross that, that if Jesus is the first fruit, if we participate in his death then we participate in his resurrection, that means that our view of God's end game of, of the resurrection of the new heavens, new earth needs to match this, that Jesus came back in the flesh means that we are going to have bodies in the new heavens and new earth. Have you ever really thought about what that means for the here and now? It's a really fascinating quote from Marjorie Hoyer Smith. Jesus came to reconcile us to God, to show us how to live in the flesh as bio-spiritual creatures. In Christ, we are made new and whole, empowered to fulfill God's purposes in the flesh. Now, I would add some eschatological tension to that, just a fancy word for realizing that between the resurrection of Christ and between his return, we are in this anticipatory period where the, the earth and, and is still, uh, the old order is still here, even it is passing away. And one day it will fully pass away, the selfishness, the sin, the brokenness, the lack of shalom, all of that will end. So we need to add this tension. We don't want an eschatology, a view of the end that says, oh, I'm done. Thanks, Jesus. I've got all I need. I guess this is this is what heaven is like right now. That's not exactly the picture you get from the scriptures. There's still something we have to do. There's still something we need to announce. There's something we need to lean into. There's transformation in the here and now that needs to take place. And that is discipleship. So let's continue with her thought. Don't let me get us lost in the weeds here. I want to go to the words of N.T. Wright. He says, belief in the bodily resurrection includes the belief that what is done in the present, in the body, by the power of the spirit, matters in the eventual future in ways we can presently only guess. Does this all make sense? Does this all excite you? 
You see, the journey to the cross leads us to the empty tomb, which leads us to the realization that everything we do right now matters. Just as Christ came back in a bodily resurrection, we too have a bodily future waiting for us. And so the purpose of, of being in the life of Christ is not simply to say we're saved now, none of the physical stuff matters anymore, we're good, we're just kind of waiting. That's not the story of Christian discipleship. We become messengers, embodied messengers of resurrection hope when we lean into the embodiment of God's kingdom in the here and now. So what you do and say today, what the mission of the church was when Jesus resurrected, all of those episodes and scenes that you read in the scriptures, these historical events that happened, they all matter because the resurrection, we're not simply waiting for Jesus to get back with our, our thumbs twiddling and idly, you know, just waiting to be beamed up. That's not the picture of biblical hope. It's an active hope. A resurrection hope is one that actually can change the world around us. The relationships, the hearts, the systems, all of those things matter in the here and now because Jesus came back in the body. We're not waiting for an evacuation. We get to participate in transformation in the here and now even as we await the fulfillment of that in the new heavens and new earth. I want to close with a body prayer. I want us to be embodied and realize that there is continuity between what we experience in the here and now and what is coming at the great harvest that Paul talked about, right? That the fulfillment of the first fruits mean that we get to be in a bodily resurrection again with Jesus. So what we do now matters. Let's get in our bodies. Let's realize the embodiment of the Christian narrative, an embodied faith. It's not one that's just here and here. It's, it's in our hands. It's in our words. It's, it's in our hearts. So let us go to God in prayer with all of ourselves. So let's try a body prayer. Go on a morning walk where you can view the sunrise. Read the description of the renewed cosmos in Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Pray to God to experience this renewal in part in the here and now, and pray for the patience to await the resurrection faithfully. Uh, one of my theology professors believes that we need a renewal of the doctrine of the ascension, a realization that for the time being, the bodily presence of Jesus is not with us. And he left the church as his body. And so I think one of the things we can learn from the Easter story is how this story of the resurrection springboards the biggest movement in Christian history. From the first century on, the church exploded through the activity of real embodied people living out the good news, not just announcing it with their words or their messages, but becoming a living incarnate message. So maybe that's our challenge. If we have that kind of hope, how does that frame our mission? Is your view of the new heavens and new earth embodied? Discuss or journal how the body matters in your walk of faith with Jesus. How can we practice an embodied faith in the here and now?